And as they make their way to the back, if you would take your copy of Scripture and turn to 1 Timothy chapter 3. 1 Timothy chapter 3, we're going to read together, beginning in verse 1 through verse 13. You follow along as I read. I'm reading from the English Standard Version. It's not on the screen, so preferably you have your copy of Scripture. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 1 through 13. The saying is trustworthy. If anyone aspires to the office of overseer, he desires a noble task. Therefore, an overseer must be above reproach. The husband of one wife, sober-minded, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not a drunkard, not violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money, he must manage his own household well with all dignity, keeping his children submissive. For if, in, if someone does not know how to manage his own household, how will he care for God's church? He must not be a recent convert, or he may become puffed up with conceit and fall into the condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must be well thought of by outsiders, so that he may not fall into disgrace and into a snare of the devil. Deacons, likewise, must be dignified, not double-tongued, not addicted to much wine, not greedy for dishonest gain. They must hold the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience and let them also be tested first. Then let them serve as deacons if they prove themselves blameless. Their wives, likewise, must be dignified, not slanderers, but sober-minded and faithful in all things. Let deacons each be the husband of one wife, managing their children and their own households well. For those who serve well as deacons gain a good standing for themselves and also great confidence in the faith that is in Christ Jesus. Let's pray together. Father, as we come to these words in this letter to Timothy, we're thankful that you've given them to us. We're thankful that we don't have to try to make our own qualifications, but you have given these to us. You have inspired them. You have preserved them. You protected them. They come to us so that they're applicable to us today. And Father, I pray that um, as we work through these quickly, that you would help us to have understanding, help us to see these things in the light and in the spirit in which they're to be received. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, as I mentioned uh, earlier in the announcement time, uh, this is a special occasion in the life of our church as tonight we will be ordaining two new deacons and a new elder. And um, again, I hope that you can make the time to be a part of that, be a part of that special event as we set these men apart for gospel service in this congregation. Now, a lot of times when we think about um, leadership in the church, when we think about elders and deacons, um, we don't think very highly of it. Um, sometimes we think pretty low about these things. We think of these things perhaps much like we would think about the color of the carpet. They're, it's insignificant. We don't have to worry about that. It's not essential. But the scripture would teach us otherwise, would it not? It would help us to recognize that, yes, the governing of the church is very important. And the two offices that we see for the governing of the church are elders and deacons. And this is the biblical pattern that's given for us. We've spent many times talking about those two offices in the context of the, the whole Bible, in the context of all the counsel of Scripture regarding these two offices. And so we're not going to retrace all of those things. We're not going to take the time this morning because it would be lengthy for us to retrace the origin of those offices and how they began and how to understand them in the context of the New Testament, how to understand those in the context of our day. But we can go to these qualifications that we just read through. And you'll notice that both elders' qualifications and deacons' qualifications are given to us here. And so it would say this to us. It would say that God takes this seriously. And when you think about the fact that Jesus has set apart the church as his bride, and we read in Ephesians chapter 5 
how that he sets apart that bride, that he sanctifies that bride, that he loves that bride, that he nourishes her, cherishes her, that he has created opportunity, graces, and means for her to be set apart as holy and blameless. And if Jesus would go to that length to love his bride, to sit apart his bride, to care for his bride, then it bodes well for his people, the ones who make up that bride, to understand the qualifications that are given for the two offices that we have in the church. And so these are not offices of um, popularity. These are not offices of um, um, great fame or fortune. These are offices of service. These are offices that men are called to. They do not necessarily appoint themselves to that office. This is an office, or both of these offices rather, are offices that are to be respected, they're to be honored, and they are to serve well. And uh, we don't have time to go through all the duties, the responsibilities that are given to both elders and deacons, but we do have time to think about, again, these qualifications. Because we have three men that we want to bring before the congregation tonight, and you will have opportunity uh, to voice questions and to voice even your opposition. Uh, we've given you opportunity to come to us and um, make any kind of reservation uh, that you might have for these three men, and that's the life of the congregation, and you should have that right. It is you who put these men in place, the congregation. It's not the elders who do this. And so you ultimately are the ones who choose the elders and the deacons who will serve you and uh, love you and shepherd you, and uh, so it is our privilege now to come to these verses. And as you can see, it's a number of things that are written here, so we don't have time to touch in detail on everything that is written here. But we will touch as best we can so we can move through it quickly so you can have an idea and then come back tonight and see that these men have met these qualifications in light of um, the scriptural teaching. Now, let me say very quickly... Um, these qualifications are true for every believer. This is how every believer ought to conduct him or herself. Every believer is to be blameless, hospitable. Every believer is to not be quarrelsome. Every believer is to understand these qualifications apply to him or her. And these are not qualifications that come to a special class of people. These are qualifications that are given for God's people so that they can understand that those men who are set apart for this service can shepherd well, can serve well. And so recognize that as we work through these things. Verse 1, 1 Timothy chapter 3. This saying is trustworthy. This is a saying that is to be considered and is certainly true. If anyone aspires to the office of overseer, he desires a noble task. So um, the idea of aspiring to a noble task is the inner um, intense desire that a man might have that is motivated, that is stirred by the Holy Spirit to, des to uh, desire to serve the church in this way. Uh, in other words, it's not something that, as I said just a moment ago, that somebody seeks for some kind of popularity uh, purposes. It is something that a man seeks because he is inwardly motivated to do this. And the Holy Spirit has stirred that inward desire. It's an aspiration not of fame and fortune and uh, personal gain, but an aspiration to serve the church. And so this aspiration has to be discerned by each man. And it's under, again, the work and the influence and the priority of the Holy Spirit. But he desires a noble task, a good thing. It's a good thing to want to serve the church as an elder or a deacon. And so it is something that is, to, again, to be respected, it's to be appreciated. 
knowing this, that these qualifications do not determine a man to be perfect. In other words, <coughs> an elder or a deacon <coughs> are not measured in terms of perfection according to these qualifications, but are there signs of consistency? Can you see in their life the, the movement forward, the spiritual growth, the, the work of the Spirit of God, and the um, a willingness to submit to the Word of God, not that they are perfect. Because, listen, you know this is true. All elders and all deacons are fallible. You know this is true. <clears throat> they are men. And as men, they are sinful. And as men, they make mistakes. Um, they are disobedient. They are times, at times very um, wrong in their thinking. And they need the help of the congregation to pray, to come alongside, to give guidance, to give some kind of accountability to. Now, we don't serve in a vacuum. Deacons and elders don't serve in a, in a vacuum. They serve within the congregation and the life of that congregation. They are not above that congregation. They are called to serve and to shepherd that congregation. And so keep that in mind that you will have fallible men serving. And so this is not to measure those men and say, well, they're greater, or they're not greater, or they're perfect, or they're not perfect. Understand that this is true, of again, of all believers, but particularly, and we'll make the distinction in just a moment, for the elders and the deacons. Look at verse 2, chapter 3. Therefore, because a man desires the office of overseer in this particular verse, and I would also say um, deacon, and I'll just put that in parenthesis. That's Jason paraphrase. You don't see that in the text, obviously. Therefore, verse 2, an overseer must, here's the distinction, an overseer must be above reproach. This is their calling. This is their gifting. This is what he must be. And the deacon, likewise, must be, as you see there in verse 8. Notice that. Deacons, likewise, in the same manner, in the same way, must be these things. In other words, these things are not optional to those who would lead the church and be involved in shepherding and serving. Th these things are not optional. These must be, not in perfection, but they are visible. You can see the consistency, and you can see the movement and the work of the Spirit of God. <coughs> Therefore, an overseer must be above reproach. Above reproach. This is the uh, overall umbrella. This umbrella of reproach is the measurement by which all the other qualifications fall under. They are above reproach in their gentleness, in their teaching, in their hospitality. They are above reproach. And above reproach simply means, you're going to have to excuse me just one moment here. Thank you. I'm sorry. Above reproach simply means that these men do not have any uh, accusation that can be readily made against them constantly by those in the church or outside of the church. There is not a, a definite accusation that can be made that is seen as a continuous work of those things that would oppose or be in opposition to these qualifications. That's the idea. A man can't be continually uh, accused of being quarrelsome, for example. He might at times be quarrelsome, but if it's a pattern of his life, then he is not above reproach. That's the idea. And so this is the umbrella kind of um, qualification that is given, and he must be above reproach in all of these things. And now there's going to be some crossover with elders and deacons, and we'll try to make a point to look at these. Think with me just for a moment in verse 2. This first qualification that is given after being above reproach, the husband 
of one wife. And notice, too, you'll see that same qualification found in the deacon listing in verse 12. Let deacons each be the husband of one wife. Now, typically, as it's always been understood, that would be um, um, a man does disqualify from the office because he has a divorce. And there's been, through the history of the church, different ways to understand it. First of all, people thought, well, the way that we best understand this is it, it's a prohibition against polygamy. That is, a man having multiple lives, uh, wives. And so the, the, the reality is that in Roman culture, in which the New Testament is set, and in Jewish culture, in which the New Testament is set, um, um, monogamy was the pattern. Monogamy was the pattern. Because, look, uh, immorality was no big deal. Uh, Roman men could go and outside of the bonds of marriage and find any kind of sexual pleasure that they desired. And it was no big deal. So they didn't have to marry multiple women. They could uh, find whatever sexual pleasure that they enjoyed or desired uh, outside of the bonds of marriage. So this is not a prohibition against polygamy. Uh, neither is this even though, by the way, you see that in the Old Testament, by the time we get to the New Testament, polygamy is not the issue. Neither is this a prohibition against a man who has lost his wife to death, and now he's remarried. So we can't say, well, he's remarried. He's got more than one wife. So he's not qualified. And in fact, this is not a prohibition against divorce per se. Paul didn't even use the Greek word for divorce in this language. Is he a one-woman man? Does he have eyes for the one woman who is in his life? Is he a womanizer? Does he chase after other women? Is it um, visible that he is after other women? Or is he a man who is committed to the one wife that he does have? Is he a man that is determined to be pure in body and mind in the relationship with the one woman he does have? That's the idea. And so divorce wouldn't necessarily disqualify you. Now, we want to say quickly that divorce can be a problem, and it can disqualify. It sort of depends on the cases and what's happened with the man in those divorces. For example, if a man had multiple divorces and was the cause of those divorces. Or perhaps a man was divorced before he came to Christ. This would not disqualify him. And, but in a typical way that we've understood this, we've narrowed it down and said divorce is this one sin that has no um, forgiveness, no grace, no redemption, even though the Scripture would teach that there are times that a divorce is permissible. We just don't have time to look at all of this. But you know that the scripture would teach that. Not that you should pursue a divorce, and not that marriage should be uh, disregarded as something that is throwaway and easy. And certainly in our culture, with all of the sexual pervasiveness and immorality that's all around us, the idea of a man being qualified for elder or deacon in a church ought to be based at least on the fact that he's not a womanizer. That in pure, he's pure in body and in mind. Notice the next qualification, sober-minded. And if you'll look with me in the deacon listing, you'll see that a deacon in verse 8 must be dignified. These are uh, connected. Sober-minded is the, the idea of being dignified or respectable. It's the idea of... Um, of uh, having a, a sense of um, seriousness about you, that you're not frivolous, you're not careless, you're not foolish, and people think of you as being sort of um, frivolous in the way that you conduct yourself uh, in public or even in your private life. That's the idea there. Dignified, having the, the same uh, connotation, the same idea that you would serve uh, in a dignified way, in sober-mindedness, has nothing to do with alcohol. It has everything to do just be serious-minded, taking the things of God very seriously. Uh, not to the point of being a, uh, a killjoy and not having a sense of humor, 
but taking and understanding that the bride of Christ is important to him, therefore, your responsibility as elder or deacon should be taken seriously. Next, at the um, qualification of self-control. Self-control. And now this self-control is the same idea, really. It's the, the idea of um, being um, um, disciplined, the idea of, of being um, watchful about your life, of being diligent in who you are in terms of the, the way that you act and your reactions and uh, the way that you live your life, you're self-controlled. You're not carried away by every foolish thing that comes along, but you display being a person, a man of controlled in your emotions, your thoughts, your body, your actions. Notice the next qualification, respectable. The idea of being respectable, that, that is that you are living your life in an orderly way. You're not chaotic. You're not bouncing around all over the place. You're not unbalanced. And you have an excess over here and, and a strictness over here, but you're balanced. And people see that balance in your life. And there's a consistency in that balance. And so you are respected by others. Notice hospitable here. That is, the elders should be hospitable. That is, they should be willing to share what they have. They open their homes, that they are um, willing to be involved in other people's life, especially as First John, Second John, or rather, Second John and Third John would teach, uh, hospitable to those workers of the gospel who would need help and encouragement. Um, and as we learn in the book of Hebrews, hospita hospita being hospitable means working in such a way that a stranger would find care and concern by an elder. Not only that, but able to teach. This is one of the duties of the elder. You do not see that duty in the listing of the deacon. And this is the one of the things that dis distinguishes elders from deacons, that elders are expected to teach. They are to be the shepherds of the congregation, protecting the, shep the, the sheep uh, with truth and doctrine. They are to be able to refute those things that are false and wrong. Uh, deacons are not expected to teach. Uh, that doesn't mean they cannot teach, but there's no expectation to uh, the deacon to teach. There's another duty that is given in verse 4 for the elder that's the same that we find for the deacon. If you look at verse 4, we'll come back to the others in just a moment. He must manage his own household well. And if you'll look with me <clears throat> in chapter 3, um, verse 12, for the deacon managing their children and their own households well. See, there's um, correlation between what the elder would do, what the deacon would do. That doesn't mean that their children are perfect, that every part of their life in terms of their home life is perfect. It means that they are diligent. They understand uh, the necessity of raising up their children well, of making sure that their children have an opportunity. They have the environment by which they might believe. Um, there are other things that are said throughout Titus that would give you indication that they must be believing children. But that just means children who are of the faith, children who are naturally growing, particularly and especially if those children are in the household of the elder or the deacon. Once those children come out of the household, then it's a different kind of dynamic. It's a different relationship. And hopefully and prayerfully and by God's grace, those children who are older, who are out of the household, who have been nurtured well, are continuing in the faith. But that's not always the case. And so it doesn't necessarily disqualify a man because their children are not in the faith and being obedient. And there's many other things that we could say in regard with, to that, but notice what it says to us in verse 4, that the elder is to manage his own household well with dignity and keeping his children submissive, that is, those children who are in the house. And, and notice the, the qualifier in verse 5, for if someone does not know how to manage his own household, how will he care for God's church? 
See, this is the thing. If you don't know how to manage your household, if you can't do that with dignity and your children cannot be submissive and there's not a pattern of obedience, though there might be times of disobedience and there might be times of rebellion, but it's not a regular pattern that's seen, then you can recognize that the man who is the elder should shepherd the church as he does his family. And that you can see how a man would shepherd his church, shepherd the church by the way that he shepherds his family. And so again, this is not perfection. This is not, a man does not make mistakes in raising his children. You can ask my children about the mistakes that I made. And they will tell you, and I'm sure they would tell you gladly and with some glee. Uh, Brady will be leaving immediately uh, before the last song. <laughs> um, now, let's back up now and catch the other qualifications found in chapter 3, verse 3. Not a drunkard. And you see that same thing that is given to us in the qualifications for the deacon that you find there in verse 4, uh, verse 8, I'm sorry, not addicted to much wine. And so there's not a whole lot that we need to say there, but you understand that the man who is to be an officer in the church must not be a drunkard. He may not be in excess in any strong drink. He cannot even be uh, in excess of any mind-altering drugs. We ought to include that. They didn't know about some of the drugs and the ways that we can alter our minds today. And so this would be including that. And I think that that would be, again, not necessarily explicit in the text, but implied in the text. Don't be a drunkard. Don't be involved with excess drink. Notice the next qualification, not violent, but gentle. That is, not using violence to settle um, disputes or arguments, not reacting to situations in violence, not looking to fight, not looking to uh, stir trouble up by violence, but rather being gentle, not quarrelsome. The next one that is listed for us, uh, it does not dis- a man who is an elder nor a deacon should not be one who is um, stirring up disunity. Because they're also always quarreling. They're always looking to um, be involved in some kind of argument. There's always some uh, movement of their spirit toward confrontation. Now, again, this is a pattern of their life. It's not that there might not be times that a man would be quarrelsome in his sin. But the pattern of his life ought not to be this way. Notice two, not a lover of money, which is the same thing that's given to us in verse 8. Not greedy for dishonest gain. So the deacon nor the elder should be involved with dishonest gain or greedy for their money. Their business dealings should be above reproach, remember? And everything that they do with their finances should be above reproach. And so money would be a great temptation for any man who is leading in the church to take advantage of that money or to use that money in a personal way. Now, listen, look, I want you to think about this. The reason why we're jumping back and forth is because, look, there's not a downgrade from elder to deacon. These are the same qualifications. These are the same expectations. You don't say, well, the elders are above the deacons in terms of qualifications. These are the same. They don't lessen. These stay consistent. These become, by the way, the pattern for the New Testament church, no doubt. After they're codified here, after they're written down, um, there had to be a time in which the churches recognized that these would be applicable to all the churches, wherever the church might be. And so there wouldn't be a, a movement of downward Uh, understanding between an elder and deacon. So let's continue trying to work through as quickly as we can. Notice it says in verse 5 that if someone does not manage his own household, how will he care for 
God's church. We made reference to that. Verse 6, he, the elder, must not be a recent, recent convert. That is, he can't be one who was saved uh, recently and then put in a place of leadership. Why? Because he would become puffed up, conceited, and he would fall into the condemnation of the devil. Not only that, but moreover, verse 7, he must be well thought of by outsiders so that he may not fall into disgrace, into a snare of the devil. So the outsiders, those outside of the church, even though his position, his office is in the church, those outside of the church must see him in the light of these qualifications. He must be above reproach in these things. Now, let's finish some of the comments that are made to us about the deacon. And if we had time, we would go to chapter 6 of the book of Acts, and you would see three qualifications there that are not listed here. And those qualifications be, number one, of good reputation, um, willing to serve, and of wisdom. And though deacon is not mentioned to us in Acts chapter 6, we recognize even yet, that that is a pattern for the church that really begins back in the Old Testament. Think about this. Think about the high priest and the priestly office who served the tabernacle and the temple. Who helped them do the work? The Levites. So you see the pattern then that carries over into the New Testament when the churches begin to form is you have elders who do the spiritual teaching and leading of the church, but you have the deacons who help them carry out that ministry. And so it makes sense that it comes to the place now where we have qualifications for both offices. And again, there's not a um, departure in the expectation. They're on the same level. They may have different responsibilities, but they're on the same level in terms of qualifications. Now, let me say this. There, there are no explicit duties given to us for the elder or the deacon that, um, I should say, that are um, beyond this. They're not explicit. Beyond the teaching and managing your household well. We have to put all of the scripture together to put together a job description for both offices, and I think there's a reason for that. In the local church, every elder, every deacon would serve under the service of that church, and so it would be flexible. It would be according to the needs of the church. How do deacons serve in that church? According to the needs of that church. How do elders serve in that church? According to the needs of that church in regard to other things that would be given to us in Scripture. Let me give you one example. Remember in the book of James, when someone is sick among you, who is the church to call? The elders, right? And so then there's a sense that the elders would go and pray. This would be a duty that the elders would be held to, and um, not necessarily the deacons. Certainly they could be a part of that, but for the elders is, uh, particularly... Well, let's look very quickly and finish up. De deacons, likewise, must be dignified. We already spoke to that. Not double-tongued. That is not gossips. Uh, not flattering people. Not misusing their words. Not spreading rumors. Not double-tongued. It's the idea of saying the same thing, but you say the same thing to one person, and then you say it to the next person with different motives and different intents. Not double-tongued. Not addicted to much wine, we spoke about. Not greedy for much grain or dishonest gain. Notice verse 9, they must hold the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience. That is, deacons must hold to the truths of the faith. That is, that they don't have any disconnect with the doctrines that are taught in the Scripture. And those that would come against them, those people outside of the church... Remember, they're to keep a good reputation of those outside of the church. It's okay if people outside of the church come against an elder or come against a deacon because of the things that man believes, as long as it's biblical. But it's not okay if they come against that man if they're inconsistent with these qualifications, for example, quarrelsome or drunkenness or whatever the 
case may be. But these deacons hold fast the mystery of the faith with a clear conscience. Notice verse 10, and let them also be tested first. That is, you test deacons before you put them in the office. You watch their life. You watch the consistency of their life. You listen to them speak. You do this just as you would an elder. Let them also. Let who also? The deacons, as they are tested, so also the elders would be tested. So there's implied there a testing for the elders. And let them serve as deacons if they prove themselves blameless. And then there's the text that verse 11 gives about the deacon's wife. This would be applicable also, as you might guess, to the elders' wives. The elders' wives must be dignified. The same kind of um, understanding as dignified for the deacon in verse 8 or um, above reproach or sober-minded for the elder. The deacon's wife, then in verse 11, must be, not be a slanderer. She must not be a gossip. She must not be a busybody. Uh, she, too, must be serious-minded about the things of the church and be faithful in all things, in the household with children. And then we did verse 12 in just a few moments ago, and then let's wrap it up with verse 13. Look for the deacon this reward. Those who serve well as deacons gain a good standing for themselves in the church, in the community, in uh, the Lord Jesus, and they have great confidence of, uh, rather, in the faith that is in Christ Jesus. And so there's a reward for those who would serve as deacons, and no doubt, again, that crosses over to elders. I just wanted the congregation to see these things and be reminded of these things one more time before we come to the service tonight. Let me just quickly say this, that no man has ever done all these things, but there is one man who has, right? Jesus Christ in the flesh. He was above reproach in all these things. There was never a time that he was inconsistent or failed in these things. Now, he was accused. I mean, why do you think somebody said to him, um, the religious leader said, uh, you're a wild member. You hang around prostitutes. I mean, he did these things, but not, not without sin. I, he, he, he never sinned. He never sinned. That, that, is that, did I say it right? Yeah. He did not sin. And so this is, this is, again, something that you have to keep in mind for every elder and every deacon. That man did not do these things and does not do these things. Jesus, his Savior, did these things. And that's why he can serve. That's why he can serve. And listen, you may be here this morning and you're thinking, well, I sure am quarrelsome. I, I'm, I'm in excess in some things in my life. I'm not sober-minded. I'm not serious about the things of God. I, I um, have trouble in managing my own household. Listen, you're, you're going to fail in that, uh, and you're going to fail greatly, but if you would come to Christ, if you would come to Christ, you could receive the help that you need. If you would humble yourself now and recognize that in your pride you cannot do it, but in your humility, as you trust Christ, he will do it for you. He will accomplish for you what is necessary. Not that you need to be an elder or a deacon. That's not the goal. But that you be a new creature in Christ. That you would be changed. Would you come to faith in Christ? Please see me immediately after the service. Come talk to me. Uh, come talk to Kyle Slaymaker, Kent Larson, Jared Haygood. These are the, your elders. We'll be glad to talk with you. We have deacons here that will be glad to talk with you. We have women who would be glad to speak with you ladies if you need to understand the gospel. Come and receive Christ. Be born again. Be changed. Now let's end our time in prayer, and I encourage you once again to come back uh, tonight. Let's pray.